In this WrestleTalk News update on Naomi's WWE future, or lack thereof, the latest on Tony Khan's interest in buying WWE, and Luke's review of last night's Raw, so subscribe and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news videos. Support WrestleTalk! Now, as you all are likely aware, the world of pro wrestling has been more than a bit eventful over the past 12 months. There's been the Vince McMahon allegations, his retirement, his swift return, the WWE sale rumors, brawl out, the list goes on and on. However, in May 2022, before any of that chaos, one particularly large WWE story was dominating many of the news headlines. And that was the double walkout staged by the then WWE women's tag team champs, Sasha Banks and Naomi. Did you forget about that in the maelstrom of other stuff? Did you forget? And while the banks, or should we say Mercedes Monet narrative has now been wrapped up following many, many months of uncertainty with her recent debut at NJPW's Wrestle Kingdom 17, spelling out her official WWE exit, what about Naomi? Is she gonna do the same? Well, according to Fightful Sean Rossat, WWE were confident of Naomi returning to the company as of only a few weeks ago, with contact reportedly being had between the two parties regarding a return. However, no timeline was given. This all naturally led to a lot of speculation, particularly surrounding a potential run return for Naomi, which of course did not happen. And now it seems that a return for Mania season, or any time for that matter, is looking less likely than ever. And that is if recent changes to Naomi's social media are anything to go by. Because recently it was noticed that Naomi had scrubbed her bio with any mention of WWE and her time in the company, replacing it with a rather on-the-nose indication that Naomi may be no more, as her bio now simply reads, just Trinity which is of course her real name. While this by no means proves anything, it certainly does seem to indicate that Trinity could be set to follow the footsteps of her best pal Mercedes and carve her own path separate from her longtime employer. Now, as previously mentioned, the sale of WWE has been a rather prominent story as of late, as numerous major media powerhouses seemingly began to circle the lucrative property like sharks in the water with a sense of blood. Or so we thought. However, as Luke discussed in yesterday's news, the appeal of a WWE purchase may have been diminished slightly for some buyers with the reported recent withdrawal of Comcast from the race. And there's something that may or may not have had something to do with Vince McMahon's potential involvement in the company post-sale. According to a January 12th article from CNBC, McMahon's future involvement has been said to be a sticking point with many potential buyers, with Nick Khan publicly reaffirming on CNBC's squawk on the street that Vince would step down if it was in the best interests of the company and the sale in response. Response. Now, despite these question marks remaining, there seems to be one party whose interest has not wavered from buying the company, none other than AEW president Tony Khan and his father, Shahid Khan. In CNBC's aforementioned article, the Khan family was confirmed to be an interested party in the WWE sale, with the only question remaining whether Vince would actually facilitate a sale to the owner of his closest competitor. This being something that Tony Khan seems to have his doubts over, alluding to it while providing an update on his interest in the sale on a recent appearance on the Mark Hoke show saying, if there is a sale process, certainly I'm interested in it and potentially being involved in it. We'll have to see what the process is and who exactly they'll let get involved in it. Certainly, I'm interested in it very much. Now, this whole sale business is sure to have plenty more twists and turns with Nick Khan also revealing in his CNBC appearance that the timeline of a sale is likely to be within the next three months. So make sure you stay locked to WrestleTalk.com for any and all future updates. Thank you for your support on Patreon. Have an argy bargy, Margie Pargy, and Ryan Disco Stewart. You can have your name read out on the Wrestle Talk news by heading on over to patreon.com forward slash Wrestle Talk. And now it's time for my review of Monday Night Raw, aka Bloody Hell That Cody Rhodes segment was dead good edition of Monday Night Raw in about five minutes. The show opened with Edge making his latest return to WWE with his wife Beth Phoenix in tow to cut a promo on Judgment Day. You know, the people he's been cutting promos on for nearly an entire year at this point. He put over the group with Rhea Ripley, who was sadly not on the show this week, getting the biggest reaction of the lot. Judgment Day came out to accept a tag match at Elimination Chamber, with Damian Priest stumbling over his lines to hype up his qualifying match for Money in the Bank. I mean the Royal Rumble. I mean the scramble match. I mean the casino ladder match. I mean Armageddon Hell in a Cell. I mean Elimination Chamber. 
Nailed it. While I did like Edge's promo, shout out to Jamiroquai, I'm really done with seeing Edge feud with Judgment Day and want both to move on to anything else. I also don't think this helps Rhea in any capacity, who should be looking as dominant as possible heading into WrestleMania against Charlotte. I think I'd much rather have seen Rhea and Phoenix have a singles match, which Rhea then would have won. Judgment Day surrounded the ring, but were cut off by Street Profits to set up Priest vs. Angelo Dawkins in that Elimination Chamber qualifier. And this match, rule. The action was great and this was an awesome showing for Dawkins as a singles guy. A lot of the hype around Street Profits usually lands on Montez Ford, but hot dog is Dawkins darn good. Priest won with South of Heaven, but he had to work for it. Maximum Male Models officially signed with Raw and Chelsea Green asked for an Elimination Chamber qualifier saying she could easily get Adam Pearce fired if she wanted. Dexter Loomis beat Baron Corbin in a match that I think was written down on paper just to annoy me, and later on JBL split up his partnership with Vaz because he sucks. His words, not mine. I don't know what point any of this was, and I don't know if there'll be any follow-up to it either. I mean, there probably will be, but I think my lack of thinking about it speaks volumes about how little I care. Brock Lesnar cut a promo on Bobby Lashley saying he cannot stop thinking about him even when he's having sex with his wife. Just kiss him, you fool! He challenged him to a match at Elimination Chamber, which Bobby didn't really accept because... Well, he's already beaten and embarrassed Lesnar. So Brock gave him a couple of F5s. There'll be a contract signing next week. Carmella made her return to Raw and won a four-way to qualify for the Elimination Chamber, beating Piper Niven, Candice LeRae, and Mia Yip. The story was that she didn't really do anything and instead tried to steal everyone else's pins, eventually pinning Candice after a Piper Niven cannonball in the corner. This character can work so long as you're consistent with it. And I really hope there's something big on the horizon for Piper Niven, because she's awesome. A properly reunited Hurt Business of Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin with MVP in their corner beat Alpha Academy in a fun little match, highlights of which were certainly Cedric and Chad Gable working together, who have excellent chemistry. And backstage, Adam Pearce booked a Miz vs. Rick Boogs match for next week. Chelsea Green got an Elimination Chamber qualifying match against Asuka and her new entrance music. This segment didn't quite go as I'd imagined, though. After her five-second spot in the Rumble, I was expecting Asuka to murder Chelsea Green quickly and pin her or tap her out. Instead, we randomly got Raquel Rodriguez and Liv Morgan appear at ringside like they just glitched into existence, Natalia also joined them, and Nikki Cross, who just a few segments earlier was backstage with Candice LeRae, appeared from under the ring. Carmella, too, came out to watch the action as Chelsea Green beat up Asuka. She then distracted herself looking at the other women and Asuka tapped her out with the rings of Saturn. This was so odd. For all the good Triple H has done with this company creatively, they will always be WWE and stage things horribly. This segment did nothing for Asuka, did even less for Chelsea Green, who would have actually got more out of it if she just lost in five seconds, and it didn't do much to hype the chamber match as they all stood there so Bianca Belair could cut a promo. This was... It was not very good, but thankfully what came next was undeniable. Cody Rhodes came out for a promo as WWE find themselves in quite the contrary. Cody Rhodes won the 2023 Men's Royal Rumble, so it's him versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. But over on SmackDown, there's a tiny little problem called Sami Zayn, who has accidentally become the biggest babyface on the planet, and now people want to see him beat Roman Reigns for the titles at WrestleMania. Last week, they handled this quite well, and Cody showed that this WWE audience do also want to see him in a Mania main event, perhaps even more than Sami. But you have to skirt the line. You don't want Cody to feel like he's the second choice, but you also don't want him to overshadow Sammy because that could turn the crowd against him. And once again, WWE nailed it. Cody put over Sammy, even teasing that it could be him versus Zayn at Mania, until Paul Heyman came out to confirm that the main event of WrestleMania will indeed be Roman versus Cody. Sorry, Sammy. Heyman and Rose then did a brilliant AEW-esque worked shoot promo. Cody talked about his family history with Heyman and how Paul gave Dusty a shot in ECW when the family was broke in 2000, and how that appearance with Steve Carino gave his father the confidence boost that he needed. Cody even alluded to his time in All Elite Wrestling, saying that he's not supposed to talk about that, which only made the segment feel all the more real. And Heyman, holding back the tears, talked about his admiration for the American dream, how that man trained and prepped the biggest names in WWE today. Seth Rollins, Becky Lynch, Bayley, and your current WWE Undisputed Universal Champion, Roman Reigns. He peeled back the curtain even further to reveal that, 
In his final conversation with Dusty Rhodes, he confided that Cody was his favorite son. Sorry, Dustin. And then the mask fell and the facade was dropped as he gave the devastating line, but Roman is the son he wished he had. It was a masterful performance by Heyman and that twist of the knife line really caught me off guard. It was brilliant. And that's not to take anything away from Cody either because he was as real as it gets. He shook Paul's hand firmly and said that he just wanted to win the title, but everyone wants to make things personal. So he's now gonna win the titles at WrestleMania personally. This was wonderful and a brilliant way to kickstart the feud between Cody and Roman. I loved it so, so much. Montez Ford then qualified for the Elimination Chamber beating... Hey, who did he beat? Let's check my notes. Oh yeah, Elias. Craig, you talk about someone who doesn't matter on Raw. Ford won in a convincing manner and commentary spelled out the idea that he's going to have a good run in the chamber, with Austin Theory even on commentary to hold up the belt against Ford after the match. But it was Seth Rollins that stood tall, attacking Theory by the commentary desk, and like Edge and Balor, I'm done with Rollins and Theory. And the main event saw Becky Lynch even up the odds against Bayley and her interfering friends by bringing out her one-time rival, Lita, to attack Io Sky and Dakota Kai, slamming the door into Bayley's head so Becky could hit the manhandle slam for the win. It was a really fun cage match that should have happened two weeks ago, but what are you gonna do? And the finish with Lita was an inspired choice, given Becky's history with her and Bailey's for that matter. It was a really great way to cap off what was a totally fine episode of Raw, made into an awesome episode with that Cody Rhodes Paul Heyman segment. Totally elevated this episode, which means I can't give it any less than four out of five. In this Wrestle Talk news, a potential buyer of WWE dropping out could hurt the sale of the company, which might also be the reason more cuts are being made. Could WWE be targeting AEW relationships and more? 